welcome everybody. We, we've got an audience here, but we've also got an audience online. This is the, the modern hybrid way. So uh, welcome to those of you in the room and those of you who are joining uh, from various parts of the world um, for this evening's discussion. Uh, my name is Phil Clark. I'm a professor in the politics department here at SOAS. And this evening's event is co-hosted by the African Politics Program in my department, uh, the Centre of African Studies and also the Royal African Society. So welcome on behalf of the, the three organisations. Uh, it, it's a real honour to have come back to us, um, a, a good friend of SOAS who we've benefited from, uh, from his insights a lot in, in recent years, um, Jonathan Fisher, um, Professor of Global Security uh, at the University of Birmingham. And he's going to be speaking this evening about a book for which I've got the flyer, and there are copies of the flyer over there. Please grab a copy, please buy the book, please help struggling academic <laughs> authors, I think is the big message this evening. Um, the book that Jonathan has uh, co-authored with Nina Villan is African Peacekeeping, uh, published by Cambridge Uni Press. Uh, it's a very timely book, and tonight is a very timely discussion looking at, at new trends uh, in African peacekeeping. I think this is an increasingly important and also complex terrain, particularly given the patchwork of peacekeeping formations uh, that are becoming more complicated by the day across the continent. I think the book is also really important for looking at issues around civil and military relations. So not just peacekeeping uh, as a military activity, but also as a political and as a social and, and economic force as well. Many of you will have seen the news this morning about uh, the, the East African regional force potentially taking over MONUSCO's mandate in Eastern Congo. I think events this morning just reinforce how important this book and this presentation is. Just a little bit of background um, on Jonathan. Uh, he's written extensively on authoritarian regimes, issues of security and insecurity, particularly uh, in East Africa. Um, he wrote, I think, a really important book a few years ago, East Africa After Liberation, Conflict, Security in the State uh, in the 1980s, also with CUP, um, a book that I use in my own teaching and that I know many of you have consulted as well. Really, really important book about, about the politics, the post-liberation politics of East Africa in the last 30 or 40 years. Jonathan's also, I think, probably still recovering from his stint as the head of the International Development Department uh, at Birmingham, so he's definitely done his time uh, in, a, in a senior uh, university position there. And he's also just wrapped up his stint as the co-editor of Civil Wars, a um, very prominent journal in, in peace and, and conflict studies. Um, so he's made a, a really big contribution, I would say, to the whole field of African politics, but also uh, conflict uh, issues. And it's very much in that vein that he's going to talk about his and, and Nina's new book this evening. So Jonathan, delighted uh, to have you here. Jonathan's going to speak for about 40, 45 minutes, then there'll be lots of time for Q&A, both with the people here in the room and, and for those of you online. Those of you online, uh, when we get to the Q&A, you'll be able to ask your questions either in the chat box or we'll be able to throw the floor open. You'll be able to ask your questions verbally um, as well. That's more than enough for, uh, from me. Jonathan, over to you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Okay, uh, thank you very much, Phil. That's a really, really kind introduction. Um, much appreciated. And thank you very much for inviting me to, to speak today as well. Uh, and indeed to SOAS and Centre of African Studies and Royal African Society for inviting and hosting me today. Um, I'm hoping that everyone online can hear me, um, hear me as they will, uh, or rather can. Um, and so as Phil was saying, um, I'm going to be speaking about this book. Um, here's a copy of it so you know that it's real. Um, it is co-authored by myself and, and Nina Willem, who's based at the University of Antwerp and uh, the Egmont Institute in Brussels, where she is Africa Director. Uh, uh, she is not here, obviously, as you can tell, uh, but she is currently in Niger, where she's doing some, some work out there. I believe that she is online somewhere, so she may be able to join us in some of the Q&A um, to respond to anything which I can't respond to or don't respond to very well. Um, and her work... Um, is you know also like mine interested in peacekeeping, but she also focuses on uh, post-conflict uh, sort of reconstruction, uh, gender and security, and she's also focused quite a lot in more recent years on the Sahel, uh, although it's a Burundi and Congo where most of her work before that was was focused. Um, 
So yes, I'm going to take you through some some of the highlights of the book. Uh, if it is a book that you think you still want to know anything about at the end of that presentation, um, then as, as Phil said, there are some uh, flyers over there. You can get a 20% discount. Um, so this is a hardback, but there is a paperback version as well, which is just under 20 quid. So it's not quite the normal uh, extortion at academic cost. Um, and if you're online and you're interested in that, then I can uh, send you the PDF of that uh, if you wanted to send me an email after this. So uh, in terms of setting up, uh, okay, so to try and give you a sense of why, uh, why we have become interested in this topic of, of peacekeeping by African states, um, this is just a, a little vignette to uh, whet your appetite, and it's also something which uh, which we found very interesting. And indeed, we start the book by talking about this particular episode. So back in 2018, when there was still a uh, pretty devastating civil war underway in South Sudan, there was talk in the region about sending in a sort of peace support, stabilization style force under the uh, Intergovernmental Authority on Development, or EGAD, which is the sort of East African security bloc. And during those discussions, the Somali government said that it was interested in sending troops to help uh, it manage that situation in, in South Sudan. Um, and, uh, you know, from some perspectives, um, this is quite a, an unusual or uh, questionable thing for Somalia to be interested in. For those of you uh, who know, Somalia is and was in 2018, the site itself of a uh, peacekeeping mission, uh, the African Union mission in Somalia or AMISOM. Uh, which is the largest peacekeeping mission in the world, and one of the longest, maybe even the longest running, it's been there since 2007. So Somalia was actually the site of the peacekeeping operation itself, and in many respects, the, uh, the Somali government of the time, uh, and to some extent is still the case now, was only really able to uh, maintain itself uh, in office, um, operationally, even physically, in Mogadishu, because of that peacekeeping mission, in terms of the protection that it provided and the support it gave to governing institutions. There's an interesting question about why would a state which in, in some respects um, is actually uh, in a state of conflict itself and is the host of a peacekeeping mission, why would that state then also uh, want to send troops outside of its borders to keep the peace uh, or rather engage in peace and conflict resolution elsewhere in the continent? Uh, some other things which give us a uh, pause to thought when it comes to these sorts of questions. Uh, I'm not sure if both slides are moving across uh, on the online. Um, shall I just leave that and, and hope, hope that it is? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just move it like that. Yeah, maybe I'll just go across like that and then just change it. Right now. Yeah, sorry, I'll do that. Yeah, so there's, there's that. There's also... Uh, an interesting um, phenomenon if you have a look at the uh, major contributors to UN peacekeeping. So this is not all peacekeeping operations of the world, this is all peacekeeping operations under the UN. And this is from 2021. So this is when we were actually putting the book together. Uh, and you can see here that um, African states appear quite prominently amongst the top 20 contributors to UN peacekeeping missions. Uh, and not only are they quite prominent, so I think about half of the top 20 are, are African states here, um, but they also uh, appear uh, quite near the top of the list as well. So I've got Rwanda, number two, Ethiopia, number three. Another thing to say about this is that if you look at just these uh, countries on this list, we have countries from all over the African continent. Um, so there are different regional dynamics I think we can talk about when it comes to peacekeeping in Africa. But even just this snapshot here, you know, we've got states from, from East Africa, from Southern Africa, uh, from Central Africa, from West Africa. And we also have countries from all different types of political system. Uh, so we have, you know, places like Rwanda, Ethiopia, which are amongst the most authoritarian countries in Africa. But we also have South Africa, Ghana, um, Senegal is also a little bit uh, in the middle of that list as well. The country's most, uh, sorry, the continent's most democratic polity as well. So there's a whole range of different types of, of polity. This list has changed a little bit uh, since 2021, uh, which you can have a look at. Um, but in, you know, some of the countries have gone down a little bit, but in other cases, they've actually gone up, South Africa uh, being an example of that. So uh, this is still fairly, um, fairly uh, representative of where things are at the moment. So African states are pretty prominent when it comes to UN peacekeeping operations. 
And that's before we even get to um, looking at non-UN peacekeeping operations. So uh, peacekeeping, which is undertaken by regional and other types of organization like the African Union. Uh, and if you look at some of those regional uh, organizations and missions, we then start to see other things coming in as well. So places like Uganda, Burundi, uh, Nigeria, for example, uh, doesn't tend to participate in UN peacekeeping that much, uh, at least by comparison to some of these other actors, but it's very prominent when it comes to uh, regional peacekeeping, including through ECOWAS. And importantly, some of these uh, states have been um, contributing to peacekeeping for quite a long time. Uh, Ethiopia, for example, has been contributing to peacekeeping for a very long time. Uh, but in other cases, African states have become peacekeepers fairly recently. This is just, again, a little snapshot, but, you know, places like Rwanda, uh, South Africa, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a moment, um, have become very significant peacekeepers uh, in a very short space of time, um, particularly in the case of, of Rwanda, I would say. So there's lots of different reasons why it's interesting to try and think about, well, what's going on here? What explains this prominent involvement of African states of all different types and across the continent in peacekeeping operations, both under the UN and the African Union and under regional organizations as well. And just to qualify the title of our book, uh, which is African peacekeeping, um, what we mean by that is peacekeeping by African states and people. So what we're not trying to say in that title or indeed in the book is that there is a single African approach to peacekeeping. Um, though what we do draw out throughout the book is various themes which we can, uh, we can think about in terms of commonalities in different regions and across different types of uh, polity. Um, and we also have to take, keep in mind that many African peacekeeping operations and the sort of rationale behind those come from shared or notionally shared ideas about uh, African solidarity, pan-Africanism, African partnership. But we're not suggesting that there's a single African approach to peacekeeping. We're also not saying that peacekeeping is as significant uh, or even at all significant uh, in every single state on the continent or to the same degree. It is very significant for some states, and we're going to talk about a couple of those examples in a moment, but in some cases it's actually fairly insignificant. So if you look at a country like Angola or Mozambique, peacekeeping is not a particularly um, significant activity for those countries. But what's important to emphasize is that peacekeeping is nonetheless relevant in every single part of the continent. So this is not just a East African phenomenon or a West African phenomenon. We see peacekeeping being undertaken by African states in every part of the continent and across every type of government. So the question that we're asking is this one. What are African states doing in this arena, the arena of peacekeeping? And what are the implications uh, of that for Africa as a continent and indeed for peacekeeping as a phenomenon as well? And that is the, if you like, the guiding question for, for the book. So we're not really interested in questions about uh, effectiveness. A lot of the, the literature on peacekeeping focuses on questions of, you know, does peacekeeping work? Is this particular peacekeeping mission effective or not effective? There are lots of different reasons why we don't really take that approach, partly because lots of people have done that already, and partly because, uh, you know, when you start trying to unpack that question, does peacekeeping work? There's a whole load of assumptions that you then have to think about within that. You know, what does a successful peacekeeping mission even look like? Uh, whose you know, success are we talking about here? So we're actually much more interested in what's going on in the states that are sending peacekeeping troops um, than in what's actually happening in terms of the effect of those missions on the ground. In terms of the sources that we use to get here, so this is this is in many respects the culmination of quite a lot of different research projects that Nina and I have undertaken over the last decade or so. Um, and we sort of, uh, I think it was about 2015, 2016, when we sat down and thought, actually, there's lots of things that we have written about, both together and separately, which we think can be pulled together into a much more um, comprehensive analysis of, of peacekeeping uh, in Africa. So um, the, the green shaded countries here are countries where we have undertaken uh, field work, whether that's in the form of interviews or um, uh, sort of attending or participating in different conferences or workshops, often uh, sort of closed workshops, including um, military or security officials from different African countries and from uh, development partner countries in Europe and the US and elsewhere. 
um, field visits, including to uh, African peacekeeping training centers um, uh, in Ethiopia, for example, and in archival research that we've undertaken as well, uh, including at the uh, Intergovernmental Authority on Development in Djibouti, uh, the pictures out there, and of course, the African Union. And Nina has done quite a lot of work on the African Union and peacekeeping there um, as well. So that is what informs our research. And you can see that obviously we haven't undertaken research in every single country that sends troops into peacekeeping missions in Africa. I think that would be uh, almost impossible. Um, but we have undertaken this work in every region of the continent and in many different prominent peacekeeping states in order to get a sense of the different dynamics as well as some of the commonalities that we've seen. Just a quick uh, note about the terminology here. Um, and actually, I was just having this conversation um, immediately before this, uh, this presentation. So we use the term peacekeeping as the title of the book. But actually, um, peacekeeping is not a term that the African Union itself uses. The African Union uses peace support operations. The UN still uses peacekeeping. Um, there's different reasons for this, um, but the, the reason that we take the approach of, of not really being absolutely uh, definitive about what counts as peacekeeping, what counts as peace support operations, what counts as a stabilization mission or a, even a counterinsurgency operation. And indeed, some scholars have suggested that various peacekeeping operations or peace support operations in Africa more closely resemble counterinsurgency operations than they do traditional UN style um, peacekeeping. And indeed, the Amazon mission in Somalia is an example of uh, that for some. So we don't we don't maintain this very clear um, distinction between definitions here, because what we're trying to do is think about what's actually happening on the ground, what's happening in reality. Um, and often the official language obscures this as much as it reveals. So in many respects, you know, peacekeeping is evolving quite rapidly uh, in the African continent and in the in terms of what African troop contributing countries are doing. And we don't want to draw clear distinctions around, well, this is a peacekeeping operation, this is a peace support operation, um, because actually things are evolving very quickly and many missions, including um, uh, the one that Phil mentioned right at the start, uh, are more resembling kind of one of a kind type missions than actually something which is a standard um, model that you might get from a traditional UN operation. So we use peacekeeping in a kind of more general sense, if you like, than with a clear UN style definition. Uh, and the argument that we make is um, is a broader one than, as I said, looking at effectiveness. So we're not really focusing on um, peacekeeping as a kind of technical or discrete practice. Uh, often the literature will focus it on it in that regard. So it will sort of look at, well, you know, as a kind of separate activity, let's look at what is happening in peacekeeping and whether it's working or not. But actually what we argue is that peacekeeping is woven into the politics of many African polities and many regions of the continent, not uh, in exactly the same way, not to the same degree uh, in, each, in each part of the continent, but it's nonetheless a key part of politics in many different respects. So we argue that it should be understood as part of a broader historical uh, negotiation, expansion and restructuring, or even reinvention of African state authority and indeed identity over time. So we take a broad uh, historical understanding of, uh, of peacekeeping, and we see it as a key part of the way in which African domestic, regional, and international politics is playing out uh, and will continue to play out, rather than a particular uh, discrete activity that can be measured or, or assessed in that regard. Um, and we do this across a couple of different um, areas. So I'll talk about some of these in a bit more depth in a second. Um, so we, we look, for example, at the ways in which peacekeeping in some parts of Africa um, has been used or instrumentalized or fed into the uh, construction and maintenance of militarized states, uh, particularly authoritarian states, something we see in particular in East Africa, but also parts of um, Central Africa as well, if you can say like Chad. The role that peacekeeping has come to play in Africa's international relations, the significance that peacekeeping has in a range of different states in terms of nation building and uh, identity building or rebuilding. Uh, and linked to that, the role that peacekeeping has come to play in uh, situations of post-conflict reconstruction. The Somalia example I gave at the beginning is maybe an extreme example of this, but we see the peacekeeping becoming quite an important factor in the ways in which different states seek to um, 
renegotiate statehood and authority and identity, and indeed um, the management of different armed forces that are now coming together into a post-conflict national army. And peacekeeping can be super important um, in those processes. Two areas that we maintain a, a key focus on throughout the book. Um, first of all, the importance of, of history. So a lot of the time when people write, uh, if you like, the traditional story of African peacekeeping, it tends to start in the 1950s or the 1960s uh, with the establishment of the Organization of African Unity and some of the early peacekeeping style missions that it sought to undertake in, uh, in Chad, uh, but also the broader history of peacekeeping globally um, with the United Nations and so forth. And this picture here is, uh, is some Ethiopian uh, troops. Uh, Ethiopia was a uh, prominent contributor to the UN uh, command mission in Korea during the 1950s, so it's a long, long history in, in peacekeeping. But we think it's also important when thinking about um, peacekeeping by African states to consider the context and the legacies of colonialism, uh, European colonialism. And we don't, uh, in this regard, go down very far down the sort of imperial peacekeeping route. Um, this sort of strand of literature, which it essentially argues that peacekeeping is intrinsically uh, imperialist and colonialist. Um, and we don't try and, and make that argument in terms of comparing what you know, European colonization uh, and imperialism and peacekeeping to what African states themselves are doing in the continent uh, with regard to peace uh, and peace and conflict resolution. But we do uh, seek to trace some of the continuities and echoes that we see from the colonial period to the present day, uh, because we think that those continue to be relevant and important, and indeed are critical for understanding some of the dynamics here. So one key element of that would be the, uh, the continued prominence of military um, and the police um, in the governance of, uh, of African states in, in many cases, uh, and in the maintenance of authority which we can trace back to the colonial era where there was obviously an enormous amount of investment in the uh, sort of violent extractive forces of the colonial state um, in terms of you know, state building and governance at the expense of uh, supporting and building uh, civilian structures um, of governance. And that has had a, a legacy uh, and echoes in, in a range of African states today. Uh, examples, if you think about the, the nature and the relationships and the role of militaries and police forces, uh, in places like uh, Nigeria, uh, even Ghana to a certain extent, which I'll talk about in a moment, Malawi, Kenya, uh, and some Francophone states as well. Um, there are, of course, examples where uh, post-colonial African states sought to actively um, unravel some of those legacies. Tanzania would be an important example of, uh, of that, um, but that is not universally the case. So we trace some of those, uh, those continuities. And as I've mentioned, Ghana is... Uh, it's not one we traditionally would focus on in this regard, but we do think there's some important uh, lessons um, to be held even for a country like Ghana. So Ghana, the Ghanaian police force is a range of um, scholars um, have written about, so people like Festus Gordon or Justice Tankebe um, have, have essentially argued that um, the Ghanaian police force has not been fundamentally uh, reoriented uh, since the colonial period in terms of things like um, accountability and relationships with the with the civilian um, or with citizens and so forth, responsiveness. Um, so as, as Tankebe has written about, policing in Ghana, as it was during colonial rule and contemporary rule, continues to be characterized by abuse, violence, intimidation, and widespread corruption. Um, but of course, these are um, the same police that are also participating in, uh, in peacekeeping um, in various different ways in different parts of Africa by, uh, sent by, by the Ghanaian state. And one of the things which we also point to in this regard is the blurring that we see in a range of cases between uh, domestic policing and you know, governance and international peacekeeping. So Emma Barikarang, um, who is based at the um, Peacekeeping Training Center in, in Ghana, has written some really interesting work, has focused a bit on the, the so-called formed police units of Ghana, which on the one hand are being deployed to peacekeeping missions uh, in places like uh, Somalia, but on the other hand, are also being used for domestic um, sort of uh, counter um, sort, of, uh, sort of various different military style operations domestically, uh, including Operation Cowleg and various other notional operations to deal with notional criminality in other areas. So we see a kind of blurring of 
uh, domestic law and order operations, public order management, and peacekeeping, using in, in many cases some of the same people. Which is not to say that the peacekeeping forces, when they are sent to other countries, behave in the same way as they do domestically. And in fact, in the case of Ghana and others, we see actually they behave quite differently. But there's nonetheless this blurring of the lines between the domestic and the international. Um, and that brings me to the second theme that runs throughout what we're writing about, which is a recognition that Africa's place in the international system is linked in many ways to uh, many states' role in peacekeeping. This is something that we've written about myself and Nina um, before in, in lots of different articles and, and so forth. Um, and so we don't, we don't shy away from making arguments around the ways in which uh, international actors, particularly in the West, particularly in the context of counterterrorism and so forth, instrumentalize or seek to instrumentalize African states um, and peacekeeping is, is often prominent there. Uh, international actors, again, particularly Western actors, but increasingly non-Western powers are also very significant, um, in many cases critical for the kind of financial and in some cases operational basis of peacekeeping operations. They tend to be the main people, the main actors, uh, financing training, financing um, kind of some of the actual uh, salaries of missions and so forth. But at the same time, we don't want to uh, try and suggest that Africa is simply a, a kind of passive actor when it comes to um, peacekeeping and the international system. It's in different ways sort of pulling the strings of what's going on. That's in many respects the opposite of what we, we argue in the book. Uh, because peacekeeping is also um, a key sphere in which African states exercise agency at a global level. Agency um, in the sense of uh, lots of different um, actions and carving out space in different arenas, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, but also agency in uh, sort of changing and reframing the ways in which peacekeeping itself is understood, because the fact is that so many African states are involved in peacekeeping, that their involvement in that is coming to reshape the kind of notion of what peacekeeping is meant to be and some of the ideational tenets about it as well. And it's also important to underscore that the international system, Western powers are not the only or necessarily the principal uh, audience or, or actor for many African states and, and elites and uh, uh, troops themselves when it comes to peacekeeping. As I've mentioned already, ideas of African identity, uh, solidarity, partnership, at the very least in theory, um, are often core to ways in which African states and uh, troops think about their role in peacekeeping. So we have to try and avoid this idea that the international system is in some way, uh, you know, controlling what's happening in this sphere. It's important. It's not something that can be dismissed, but it's also not something that should be overemphasized at the expense of understanding um, African agency in this sphere. So I don't know how much time I've got left, um, but what I've planned on doing is just taking you through three examples of how we build some of these arguments. So we kind of have a chapter on on each of these three different points, uh, as well as various other um, points as well. So I'm going to talk firstly about the role that peacekeeping plays in terms of national identity and regional identity, then a little bit about peacekeeping's role in uh, undergirding authoritarian rule in, in some respects, uh, and finally peacekeeping's relationship to regionalism in Africa. So turning first to identity, peacekeeping is, is, is significant because um, it has a, a kind of fundamentally normative character. So as opposed, you know, if you're a state and you uh, invade or intervene uh, in another country um, for sort of, you know, notional self-interest or other, um, other, other reasons, that's often seen as being um, problematic um, or at least very much about geopolitics, statecraft, that sort of thing. But peacekeeping is often tied to the moral sphere. There's an explicit international responsibility that comes with engaging into peacekeeping and states that intervene through a peacekeeping operation um, then take that issue out of the realm of, you know, strategy and self-interest, at least, um, you know, supposedly, and reposition it within the realm of, of the morally good. So peacekeeping can be a very important um, activity um, for the identity of different states and actors um, involved within it. An important example of this is the case of uh, Rwanda, which is already uh, emphasized is very significant in UN peacekeeping operations in particular. 
Um, so Rwanda uh, first became involved in peacekeeping in the sort of early 2000s um, in the context of the African Union mission in Sudan. And critically, that mission was uh, very much framed in terms of uh, trying to prevent a genocide happening in Darfur. And this really aligned very strongly with the Rwandan government's kind of emerging sense of its own continental and global identity as a force that was uh, there to try and prevent genocide happening. It had obviously happened in Rwanda, the international system, including the UN, uh, had not uh, done enough to prevent that. And so the kind of identity of trying to um, uh, arrest genocide and prevent genocide became very much a key part of Rwanda's regional and international identity. Um, and so some research that's been done on this um, focuses on the ways in which Rwanda has not only kind of focused its peacekeeping role on, on this particular mission, but also for taking a leadership role kind of above and beyond the UN. Um, and indeed, um, focusing on engaging in sort of anti-genocide or counter-genocide operations uh, as a means of sort of uh, reconciliation or forgiveness uh, or, or healing. So the way the language which is often used by um, the Rwandan state when it talks about being involved in peacekeeping um, is, as uh, Josephine Kulna-Larton quotes here, um, we will not abide by UN rules, we come to help, not to play the UN. What happened to the Rwandan genocide is similar to what's happening in Darfur. We're trying to behave as if we are in Rwanda, as if we're helping someone in our own country. So it's very much a, a kind of sense of identity about um, uh, sort of transporting uh, a sense of responsibility domestically to the wider region as well. And so peacekeeping has become quite important in Rwanda from the perspective of, of, of identity around uh, genocide and the experience of um, genocide in, in Rwanda. A rather different example when we're talking about um, peacekeeping and identity comes in the case of South Africa. And as I mentioned, South Africa has become a, a much more prominent peacekeeper um, in the aftermath of uh, apartheid um, and the, uh, the beginning of democracy in South Africa. And the origins of this were partly around um, the Mandela government feeling again a, a sense that um, South Africa couldn't be a kind of island of stability in a region um, and continent wracked by conflict, and it had a, a kind of global or continental responsibility uh, now that it was a, you know, a leader of the continent um, in the post-apartheid era um, to contribute in bringing peace to the rest of Africa in lots of different ways. Um, so a white paper that was published uh, in 1999 uh, kind of made this explicit uh, in linking peacekeeping to South Africa's sense of identity, or emerging sense of identity, uh, and it says since the advent, the advent of democracy in 1994, domestic and international expectations have steadily grown regarding South Africa's role as a responsible and respected member of the international community. These expectations have included a hope that South Africa will play a leading role in international peace missions to alleviate the plight of other peoples who are struggling to uh, of similar conflicts. So again, like in Rwanda, you can see a linking of its South Africa's responsibility or sense of responsibility to its own experiences. But importantly, in the case of South Africa, there's also a sense of uh, hegemony as well. That South Africa as part of South Africa's role as a major player in the African continent should be linked to peace and conflict uh, resolution rather than just uh, you know, economics and economic power. So those are some examples of the ways in which peacekeeping and identity uh, particularly in a kind of post-conflict um, situation can take shape. I'm going to move on now to the second of the three areas I was going to mention, which is the link between peacekeeping and authoritarianism. So going back to that list of uh, states, African states contributing to UN peacekeeping, you can see that of, the, of those 10 African states in the top 20 UN uh, peacekeeping countries, quite a lot of them are not considered to be democracies by Freedom House and indeed by a range of other um, organizations and analysts as well. And indeed, you have some of the most authoritarian uh, countries in the entire continent on this list, Rwanda, Ethiopia, Chad, um, Burkina Faso at the time, um, Cameroon. And indeed, if we look again at some of those other kind of regional peacekeeping operations, you bring in other states like Uganda, Burundi, and so forth. And what we argue in the book is that peacekeeping can be particularly significant in authoritarian and semi-authoritarian states for uh, regime maintenance purposes. So effectively undergirding the um, 
the kind of backbone of the military security state, but also enabling um, authoritarian and militarized governments to uh, secure and invest more heavily in that side of the state at the expense of uh, other areas where there's more accountability or, or space for civilian governments. Um, Uganda is a very important uh, example of this, uh, and indeed I think uh, Burundi as well. And one of the things which is quite interesting about both of those cases uh, we argue in the book is that peacekeeping has in some respects become fundamentally embedded in the regime maintenance strategies of those governments. It, by which we mean that we've gotten to the stage now in both of those cases where peacekeeping is um, an intrinsic um, part of how uh, international support for the military comes in, but also for things like um, the circulation of military elites. Um, in the case of Burundi, there, there's a sort of uh, arrangement within the military which enables every single person in the Burundian military to at some point circulate into a peacekeeping mission. Lots of different reasons for that. There's prestige that comes with being part of a peacekeeping mission. The uh, remuneration one receives um, is often, well, almost invariably uh, larger than you would get domestically. So there's lots of uh, intrinsic reasons why people might want to participate in peacekeeping, but it's become effectively a core part of the way in which the circulation of the military works in Burundi. And it raises some difficult questions for some of these governments then about uh, what happens when there is potentially no longer the, the opportunity to send troops to peacekeeping mission, because you don't necessarily want, if you're an authoritarian regime, um, to be bringing home lots of soldiers um, from various different theatres all at the same time, um, unless they have anything you know, more nefarious to do when they get there. So partly it's about uh, the sort of structural ways of maintaining authoritarian regimes um, in terms of you know, building institutions and securing support. Partly it's about the more instrumental ways of rewarding um, different uh, elite actors given particular roles within the military. Okay. Um, and there's also a sort of attractiveness to being able to send um, soldiers abroad if you're worried about them creating problems at home. Uh, but of course, that itself can also be a bit of an issue as well. And there's been some really interesting work that we point to in the book um, by people uh, like Maggie Dwyer, who have looked at the ways in which those, um, if, if sending troops abroad for peacekeeping missions is mismanaged, it can actually lead to situations where the government itself can be subject to challenge. So particularly in cases where you have soldiers from multiple different countries, all as part of the same mission, but they discover that actually they're being paid different amounts of money um, by the African Union or the United Nations or the regional peacekeeping organization, because um, states often have the ability to skim off money. So effectively they get paid for the soldiers by the African Union or whoever, and then they decide, well, we're gonna skim off 20% for whatever reason, and then provide the rest to the, to the soldiers. But the soldiers talk to each other, and if they discover that actually, and you know, there's examples, for example, um, you know, where Burkina Bay and Mali and peacekeepers in particular missions found out they were being paid different amounts of money by their states leading to, to mutinies, um, the same is the case in, in Guinea-Bissau as well. So peacekeeping can be very important for regime maintenance, but it can also be uh, present a challenge to it as well if it is uh, mismanaged. Um, and yet the final thing I was going to talk about in this regard was about um, regionalism. So as Phil was sort of intimating at the beginning um, of, of today's um, session, there are lots of different regional organizations in Africa that play roles in peacekeeping. We have the African Union, which is meant to be the sort of continental umbrella for those different um, peacekeeping missions. But you also have lots of different regional organizations. I mentioned EGAD in East Africa, you have ECOWAS in West Africa, uh, SADC in, in Southern Africa, and lots of other um, different examples of that as well. And peacekeeping can become quite an interesting uh, lens in which to try and understand how states position themselves with regard to their regional identity. Tanzania is quite an interesting example here. It's traditionally had a bit of an ambivalent view about its position in East Africa um, and has, you know, in the last decade or so contributed to peacekeeping through the Southern African development community rather than through East African regional organizations. Um, as a sort of example of its weird kind of uh, unresolved sense of where it sits between East um, and Southern Africa. Um, 
But I think uh, ECOWAS is particularly interesting in, in this regard if we turn to the case of Nigeria. So ECOWAS has a reputation for being probably the most um, comprehensive and, if you like, successful vehicle for peacekeeping at a regional level in Africa. And Nigeria has often focused its peacekeeping efforts around ECOWAS. I mentioned it doesn't tend to focus on the UN, it focuses on ECOWAS instead. And in part, that's related to its um, sense of itself as a regional hegemon. Um, that when it comes to uh, peace and security affairs in West Africa, Nigeria should play the um, preeminent role. And we saw this in the, in the 1990s during the civil war in Liberia, where there was disagreement in the region about how, um, how to address that issue. And the Nigerian government was very uh, driven in terms of wanting this to be a peacekeeping mission, a regional peacekeeping mission, wanting to play a role within that um, to sort of, you know, underline its status as a regional um, hegemon. But what's quite interesting is more recently where Nigeria has had concerns about Boko Haram in the, in the region, it has avoided seeking to uh, deal with that regional issue um, through ECOWAS, but through the, um, at the time, lesser known Lake Chad Basin Commission, um, which was more of a kind of water and national resources organization um, as a sort of way to facilitate regional involvement in Boko Haram, partly because uh, for domestic reasons, but also for, you know, it's somewhat embarrassing for, for the Nigerian state to have to go to ECOWAS, which was previously, you know, the, the institution which it dominated and was a vehicle of, in some respect of Nigerian hegemony, to then ask ECOWAS to come and deal with a security problem that was affecting Nigeria itself, and which in fact the Nigerian government was uh, getting a lot of um, criticism for and continues to, uh, rightly so, for its uh, inaction uh, over the crisis. So we see um, this happening in lots of different parts of the continent where states will engage in what's called in other parts of political science forum shopping, that they'll decide that actually for this particular issue, we're not going to go to EGAD, we're going to go to the East African uh, Union, or uh, we're going to go to some other organization for whatever regional or national or international um, reason that might explain that. So that's pretty much it for me. What I wanted to finish off with was just a couple of thoughts on the future of African peacekeeping. Um, this is something which we, we reflect on a little bit in the book, but this is also a very fast changing um, phenomenon. And so whatever you say in a book could potentially be wrong um, a year later. But I think so far we've been borne out rightly with this one, um, which is that increasingly we see this sort of um, breaking up of peacekeeping by African states, so moving away from uh, the idea of, kind of continent wide operations or even, um, if you like, regionally sanctioned operations by you know, standby forces or, or whatever to these much more ad hoc uh, bespoke stabilization style um, operations so you know this, this will sometimes be at the invitation of a particular government as we saw uh, recently in the case of mozambique inviting rwanda to intervene um, uh, for peace support reasons as, as was the rationale provided and similarly with the Kenyan operation uh, in, in uh, Eastern Congo as well, that's, that's through the East African Union, which is quite interesting because that was not really previously um, a military vehicle. But essentially we're seeing a, a move away from these more broad continent-wide operations to more ad hoc stabilization missions, which are aimed at particular operations and particular constellations and coalitions of state who are interested in resolving a particular issue and who will get together under whatever umbrella works best for that particular scenario um, to make it possible. And there's an open question about how far what's going on in some of these uh, operations is even close to what we might understand as peacekeeping. And then that opens a question as to, well, does that mean that the nature of peacekeeping itself is changing? Do we mean something else by peacekeeping now than people probably did uh, 10, 15 years ago? The other dimension of this, which I think is important, which we, we speak to quite a lot in the book as well, is the difference between and the emerging differences we see between peacekeeping by authoritarian and semi-authoritarian states and peacekeeping by more open and democratic states. Because there is a significant difference between peacekeeping by uh, a country which has uh, an open and free media, which has uh, open and critical debate in the national legislative, in, in you know, the public sphere. We see this in Ghana, we've seen this for you know, 20 years or so in South Africa, 
that when things are perceived to be going wrong in peacekeeping, those issues then become potentially a domestic issue for the government. Um, you know, they will maybe face a challenge in the parliament as, as the Ghanaian government has on different occasions. So peacekeeping can become uh, a sort of aspect of domestic politics as well, which is much less the case in more authoritarian states. And there are a range of examples of this. For example, African Union peacekeeping contributing countries, places like Uganda, where they just have not historically released information on even the number of Ugandan soldiers that have been killed in, in peacekeeping operations. So that even that level of basic detail is not provided or hasn't been provided by the Ugandan government. So there's a, there's a different kind of scrutiny that you will see uh, as a peacekeeping state if you're a democracy versus a non-democracy. And that is likely to continue um, in both directions. So uh, finally, uh, just end with this point, which is, again, to reiterate the main argument you make that peacekeeping in all of its various different forms has now become a practice that's woven into politics across Africa, uh, national levels, regional levels, and continental levels. Uh, and so if you want to try and understand the nature of African politics, international relations, then understanding peacekeeping is an essential part of that. Not um, exactly the same in every single region or in every single country, but nonetheless uh, at the level of understanding politics. Okay, thank you very much. Always the academic and heart and mouth technological moment. Fantastic. Um, so much to discuss in that presentation. And as I said earlier, there will be scope for people online. Uh, to ask your question either in the chat box or if you would like to verbalize your question, which would be my preference for people online. If you just put your hand up, um, then I can throw to you, but also to people here in the in the, uh, in the room. Um, let me throw it open to you, maybe as the first opportunity. Um, and if you do ask a question or make a comment, maybe just introduce yourself so that Jonathan knows exactly who he's engaging with. So can I throw it open? Yeah. I just need to speak out there. Yeah. So I am Speaker of and I'm doing my master's in general studies. I have two questions. Um, the first question is uh, so in all the slides, you had mentioned something about peace keeping uh, being about morally good. And I wanted to ask who gets to define uh, the morally good aspects of peacekeeping? And how in turn would that affect the individual agency of African population of victims, survivors, and perpetrators? And uh, my second question is how and where are African women positioned in the African peacekeeping issues? Right, Jonathan, do you want to take those two questions and then that, that'll give people a chance yep. uh, to get their thoughts together. So let, let's start with those. Thanks. Yeah, I wonder whether, because Nina's done quite a lot of work on, on gender um, and peace. I wonder if she's there. And hey. Hi, Nina. Yeah, can we draw you into this conversation as well? I'm just I'm wondering if you could hear the question. I have I had a little bit of difficulties hearing the question. Um, I, I just heard that it was about women in peacekeeping. And now it seems like I'm I've lost so you. We're just just getting our volume sorted at, 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 this, at this end. Um, yeah, Jonathan, do you want to? Yeah, I'll do I'll do the first one. Um, in that case, um, yeah, I think it's a good question about who gets to define um, what's moral or not moral. Um, and I think often that that question is there's an assumption around it rather than it being uh, unpacked critically in the international system. I suppose part of it relates to um, 
the kind of legal architecture of the of the international system whereby you know if if something is sanctioned by the united nations or a kind of subordinate um body like one of the african union or the african union sub actors at the regional level then it's seen as being kind of legally uh okay in the international system in a way that uh, unilateral intervention would not be um, but I think there are also various other dimensions to how the, the morality of peacekeeping missions is, is understood and, and framed, some of it relating to the, the protection of civilians, for example, um, the kind of the, the partiality or impartiality of the actors that are meant to be um, engaging, whether or not the, the state in question has invited um, the peacekeeping force in. But it does then raise a lot of interesting questions and sometimes quite challenging questions about what's actually happening uh, on the ground. Um, and there is some interesting research around um, some of the, the negative consequences of UN peacekeeping in different parts of the world and the challenges that uh, different organizations, governments, activists face in bringing the UN and other actors to justice. And I think we're in the, the early phases of seeing this in a variety of African um, led peacekeeping operations as well. The, part of the challenge of this is the, the kind of being able to actually get a sense of what's happening in various different locations, which are often very, uh, still very conflict effective, very difficult to undertake an independent scrutiny of. So Somalia and the different kind of accusations and allegations that have been made against various troop, different, troop contributing countries there would be a good example of that. Um, so I think we're in the very early stages of that particular debate. And I think that there's there's a broader international um, uh, sense that peacekeeping is is morally better because it is there to um, to keep the peace or to prevent violence rather than to engage actively in violence. But the problem is, as I said, that increasingly we're seeing um, the direction of peacekeeping operations um, in Africa or led by African states at the very least. Um, moving more into this blurred territory of counterinsurgency, um, you know, being invited by a government to actively engage against a particular uh, combatant or belligerent. Um, so there is a kind of open question now, which I think about you know, to what extent is peacekeeping, does it deserve that reputation of being you know, morally different to any other kind of form of intervention? Particularly because we've seen quite a few peacekeeping missions um, evolve into peacekeeping missions from what was originally in a number of cases bilateral interventions. So uh, Kenya's involvement in Somalia, Ethiopia's involvement in Somalia, those both started as um, unilateral interventions, kind of invasions, if you like, and they were then repackaged and rehatted as um, peacekeeping missions, which came with this sort of moral legitimacy, but also resources and so forth as well. But as you said, it does raise the question about, well, who is the judge of what makes that moral? Uh, and I think that that is just not resolved at the moment. Mm -hmm. The situation is moving so quickly that, that debate is yet to take place. And can you remind me of your second question? Because I'm going to pose that to Nina. I think it's hard for people to hear from the audience. So can you just, just remind me what it is? Then? It's how and when are African women chosen to lead African peacekeeping? Yeah, so Nina, it's, it, it's a question about how and, and where and in what capacity are, are women positioned in, in African peacekeeping? Um, and welcome, Nina, as well. Great to have you uh, from Niger, I understand. So it, 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 good to have you as part of this discussion as the co-author of the book. Thank you. Um, thank you for uh, for letting me participate remotely. Um, yes, so so excellent question, but also very difficult to, to answer. How and when are women participating in, in African peacekeeping? It differs, of course, um, depending on the troop contributing state, um, also what type of mission it is. But if, if I'm going to draw out broader trends, it's pretty much the same across all peace operations that women are primarily tasked with, um, they're not in the combat uh, branches. If, if you're going to look at the majority of women that are deployed in peace operations, they're, they're not in the combat branches of, of the operation. Um, there is also an overrepresentation of or overrepresentation of women in um, branches such as uh, medical staff, uh, administrative staff of missions. Um, I know for the South African uh, Army has a very high number of uh, 
female participation in their peace operations with about 22% of their um, peace operations staff or the people deployed on peace operations, which is higher than many of uh, the European states' um, contributions when it comes to, to female participation. And then, of course, it depends on, on the mission, but you can also see overall, and now I'm talking globally, there is a tendency to deploy women to missions that are considered um, safer. So there is this sort of uh, norm that women should still be uh, protected in the sense that they are not sent to, to operations that are, are um, considered closer to combat operations than uh, peacekeeping operations. And that's globally, so that's not just on, on African peacekeeping. So I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, great. <clears throat> Thanks, Nina. Um, I can see a hand up from uh, Mark Miller. Mark. And if you could introduce yourself as well before you ask a question, that'd be great. Hi, Mark. Can you hear us? Might have ducked out of the room, <laughs> leaving his hand. <laughs> I think his hand visible. So let, let me come back to the floor. Yeah, Mohammed. Uh, thanks very much for uh, doing the book. It's really important to talk to. Mm. I just I have a, a normative comment and, and, and a comment about function. My name is Muhammad. I am one of the teaching assistants in the focus. Mm. So the normative one, uh, if you didn't uh, fear that you, you would be accused that you have in Western uh, Western approach to peacekeeping, given that the, the word that you choose, the peacekeeping keeping versus the, the peace uh, support operation, could be could be looked at as a Western point of view. Um, the, norm, the normative point is when you when you look at the word peacekeeping, you will find it a very very loaded word peacekeeping and might be misleading a little bit. Uh, because this giving is not only a military intervention. So what we saw in the other presentation is the military intervention is not peacekeeping as such. Because peacekeeping has got initiation, has got, has got uh, uh, work, to, work to be done with the customary uh, uh, regional leaders. And it's very, very sophisticated and complicated um, process than, than just looking at it from military intervention. And when we look at the function, so I, I just struggle a little bit with most of the what so called peacekeeping operations in the continent are coming from a, a humanitarian point of view, as we saw in Darfur, as we saw in Rwanda, as we saw everywhere. I struggle to understand where I should locate the humanitarian intervention within the regional or the authoritarian or the identity parts that you talked about. I can see a group of hands. So I might take okay. a group of questions if, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yep. Yeah. Matt. Hey, uh, thank you for this interesting talk. Um, I haven't read the book, but I've read some of your articles and uh, I'm very sympathetic to your approach that you've taken to looking at these things. Um, I want to ask you a question about you, you mentioned at the beginning your kind of skepticism of delving into the imperialism debate. And I understand that in kind of a, a broader sense of terms, because I, I, I when you get sucked into the, the kind of uh, imperialism uh, theory, it kind of overtakes all the other dynamics, and you can see some of the rich kind of their you know, variegated interest actors, et cetera, at play, and all, you know, especially the African actors. And I think it sounds important that you bring out the agency of those involved. But I guess, um, so I, 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 I just finished my PhD, and so as I, my focus is small mm -hmm. Just coming to the Somalia example, I'm just like, th just thinking through the way, like, the, the kind of uh, motivations of Ethiopia and Kenya in this dynamic and seeing it, and I, I just can't see a way in which part of what they're not doing is not to kind of even create a state that, that's, that's um, you know, secure for them, but literally to, to determine the internal politics over the long term, installing leaders of regional governments, uh, making sure they have access to ports in the sea, which is both the case of Ethiopia, and then with Kenya, the um, Jubaland is pretty much their buffer zone plus an area where they can kind of lay claims to the oil in the sea. So these are kind of long-term projects to kind of 
annex and, and control the significant part of the territory. I know that Somalia is kind of a, a far extreme end of, of these cases, and maybe DRC is somewhat similar in some ways, which is being kind of exploited and carved up a bit. But uh, yeah, I was wondering why, why you know, how, how do you fit in that, that element and those kind of motives into the, the other three, which are also very convincing. But, Maybe there's enough there to, to deal with Jonathan and then we'll open up for another round. I, I think it's difficult for uh, people online to hear the question. So let, let me just briefly summarize this. So Mohammed's got a, a, a first question about peacekeeping being a loaded term. To what extent is there a kind of Western lens involved in, in, in even thinking about peacekeeping in these terms? And also where do we situate peacekeeping as a kind of activity, as a phenomenon? Is it in the humanitarian space? Do you see it in the military space, that kind of thing? And then Matt's, um, question here around potentially imperial logics, um, but, but coming from other African states in, within these regions, um, and, and he's citing the example of Somalia potentially in, in this regard. So, yeah, thanks, Jonathan. And Nina, you can sort of chip in as as, as you feel fit as well. But uh, maybe we'll, we'll start with Jonathan in the room. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Nina, you can feel free to add anything as well, uh, okay. if you like. Um, so I think that the term peacekeeping, we, we, we talked about this quite a lot. Uh, I mean, one thing that I'll, I'll say um, for, you know, for myself, um, the approach I take to, to research is to try and understand um, particular contexts, uh, what people are saying, but I'm never going to be able to remove myself from being, um, you know, a Westerner, if you like, you know, I was, was born in the UK, educated in the UK, um, etc. So we don't seek to to pretend that this is a, a kind of decolonized approach to to understanding peacekeeping and i think that actually it's it's quite important to um to problematize that uh, and recognize it because you know peacekeeping the way it emerged was a you know principally western led um set of uh, theories and practices and and logics and operations linked in some respects to colonialism as well as to the, you know, the situation after the, the First and the Second World War in particular. Um, and so the, the term peacekeeping, we partly use it because this is a term that African states and elites use themselves uh, in, different, in different situations. Uh, the UN uses the term peacekeeping, um, and some of the states that I've mentioned are particularly prominent in that regard. Um, I think there is another project to be done on trying to... Uh, look and analyze the different terms that are increasingly being used for what is going on in these different situations i mean at some at some level in in the social sciences you have to be able to use a, a concept which seeks to capture multiple different but related activities and we feel that peacekeeping is is appropriate for that in, in the book but we are i think getting to a situation where you know, are some of the things that African states are doing either through uh, regional organizations or through ad hoc stabilization missions, uh, does it even make sense to talk about those in the sense of, of peacekeeping? Um, because in fact, in some cases, African states themselves won't necessarily use that language. So I think that it's, it's a rapidly um, evolving and changing situation. I mean, I think there's also the question about um, the extent to which African states are engaged in these activities tie what they're doing to um, the language and the architecture and the sort of policy literature, if you like, of Western states and, you know, Western heritage. There's been some really interesting research done by actually a former PhD um, at SOAS, um, Marco Jowell, on peacekeeping training centers in Africa. So there's, you know, there's, there's one in Ghana, but there's also one in Ethiopia, Rwanda, uh, Kenya as well. Um, and actually looking through their, their syllabuses and what peacekeepers are actually taught in these centers. And part of his analysis, and I want to, um, you know, uh, mischaracterize what he argues, but essentially is to say that a lot of the material that they're looking at is very traditional Eurocentric um, understandings of peace and conflict studies in many cases which don't doesn't necessarily apply to many of the contexts in which uh, African peacekeeping missions are taking place so it's not really a very clear answer but I think that the, the, the point is that this is um, is there's so many different blurrings of western and eurocentric understandings of what's going on here and uh, African instrumentalization of that engagement with that uh sort of acceptance of that challenging of that in the case of rwanda uh and of course you know in the case of rwanda 
the language of responsibility to protect has become a, a really important calling card of the Rwandan government internationally. So I think it's more complicated than just um, Western or non-Western concepts um, because there's so, so much intermingling of um, those issues in what's going on um, that it becomes almost impossible to, to disaggregate it. And I think that the, the point that you were asking about um, like imperial logics by different states, I think is is a really interesting and important one. Um, because I think, you know, we do talk quite a lot in the book about uh, ideas of Pan-Africanism and African solidarity and, and so on and so forth. Um, but equally, you know, a lot of the, the logics that we see by some African elites engaging in um, peace building, state building, and so on and so forth are, are often, you know, fundamentally and intrinsically um, understood in a kind of Western-centric lens. So I, I wrote an article a few years ago about the different models uh, of governance and authority that the different Amazon troop contributing countries were seeking to implement in Somalia. Um, and if we look at, for example, what the Ugandan government says, or to some extent, what the Ethiopian government says, the Kenyan government, but particularly the Ugandan government, it's very much, you know, let's, let's get rid of this whole clanism thing and clans are sort of one of the basic um, forms of you know, socio-political authority in, in Somalia. Um, but the Ugandan government, there's lots of ministers and MPs and president even saying that this clan thing is a problem, we need to get rid of it and we need to build a parliament, we need to build this, we need to build this formal institution, that formal institution. So there is a there is a kind of understanding to some extent of what state building and peace building looks like, which is in many respects uh, a, a like Weberian Eurocentric understanding of institutions. We don't go into too much depth on 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 the question of you know imperialism by African states um, for a huge range of different reasons, um, but I, we do look in quite a lot of depth at different motivations as well. And I think that the there is there is often a sort of un, you can't sort of disentangle a neighbouring state engaging in a peacekeeping mission in another neighbouring state from long-standing issues of you know international relations basically and Somalia is probably probably the hardest case because it's its relationships with Ethiopia and Kenya and vice versa in terms of the you know, legacies of colonial borders and and so on and so forth um, but yeah I think that that is a particularly concerning evolution of an African peacekeeping mission which has effectively rationalized and, and reified um, the status quo of you know semi annexing bits of a country in order to make good on you know uh, an arrangement which would previously have been seen as um, illegal or problematic but because it's happening under the guise of peacekeeping has this international legitimacy to it um, so I think I probably blabbered on long enough on those points um, but I don't know whether I bring Nina yeah. in because uh, I can see Nina's hand Sure. From the share. So, uh, yeah. I, um, no, I was just, I just wanted to add to what Jonathan, Jonathan already brought it up a little bit, but um, the definition of peacekeeping and who is shaping peacekeeping. Um, I don't think that there is any question that it's a, a Western concept from the beginning, but today over 70% of the troop contributing states come from Africa and Asia. So then you can also ask how how is peacekeeping shaped um, and shaped by these con troop contributors today? And we see that there are norms. I've just done a study together with Ksenia Oksamitna on norms and rules, how they are transferred between different organizations. And, and sometimes these norms and rules, they come because something is happening in the field. So you have bottom up um, approaches from officers or uh, soldiers in the field and these officers and soldiers are, are mostly African or Asian. So the norms that are evolving from practices uh, on the ground are coming from these troop contributing states. And that's also shaping the peacekeeping doctrines that we're seeing today. There, it's shaping the peacekeeping rules and the norms. And so, so I think that it's, as Jonathan said, it's, it's much more complex than, than West versus the rest or South, uh, Southern states versus Northern states. Um, today, because it's it's constantly reshaped by different events and missions, and as Jonathan also said, we've seen so many different types of missions. Today, we can see 
Amisam uh, completely different from MINUSMA, which is also completely different from MINUSCO. So, so we can't really generalize across the missions, I think. So I'll end it with that. Good, Let, let's take another round of questions. I want to come back to Mark online, um, Mark Miller. Hi, can you hear me this time? Yes, I can. Oh, amazing. Sorry, we got here in the end. Um, so uh, my name is Mark Miller. I uh, currently work for the UK Foreign Office, but previously have worked in, uh, in the peacekeeping world uh, in South Sudan, but also in their headquarters in New York. Um, I've also written about sort of peacekeeping issues in the past. Um, so my question was about the UN um, and where they fit into all of this. And my experience in, in New York particularly was very much that um, the UN was quite keen on this idea of uh, other peacekeeping missions sort of uh, sprouting up in parts of Africa. It's, and then the language around it was couched in a sense of like uh, localizing sort of uh, responses to problems, uh, you know, and putting in people who are better able to find ways to, uh, to, to, uh, to respond to the issues on the ground. But I also felt, felt as though there was a dark side to that in as much as really much about the UN sort of stepping out of that arena uh, and really just, you know, not wanting to have those problems anymore. So my question is, what is the appropriate uh, uh, position for the UN in terms of if this uh, if this trend is going to continue, if this uh, these other types of peacekeeping missions are going to go forward, what should the UN be doing? Uh, or, or should the UN just be allowed to sort of step out completely? Great, thanks, Mark. Um, there was a question here. Hey, thank you. My name is Sylvain. There we go. Thank you for the question. You've partly answered my question. But I'm interested, perhaps, in your research and writing the book. Will you mention any successful Africa peacekeeping mission that you would say they achieved the objective with the line? And secondly, you spoke also about the motivation of why it's becoming a very interesting area that African countries are getting related. Is it partly due to perhaps the lesser stringent? Uh, um, rule like human rights abuses, violation of civilian people. Looking at the new one, the East African uh, Regional Force at the moment, by the time they've been doing the AU, hasn't given them operational cover yet. Yeah, mm. and like we've seen in the G5 Sahel, if you're not given the political cover, there's a likelihood that you're running all these multiple issues of human rights and civilian abuse. So, in that scenario, do you think? The, the reason why it's Africa, specific, uh, specifically African countries are trying to fill Africa because of the lesser scrutiny with some of the ideas that might be mentioned. Good. So again, just just for the audience here, I think you caught the first question from Mark, and then there was a, a second set of questions here. Firstly, are there any uh, successful peacekeeping cases that we can point to? The second one is, should there be concerns about the kind of loose rules, some of the lack of scrutiny with some of these new African peacekeeping missions? You know, what do we make of, of that terrain? Jonathan, I'll come back to you on these and then we'll have time for one last round okay. of questions. Yeah, thank you. Those are both really good questions. Um, and I think in some respects, the answer, the answer to both are, are kind of linked, which is one of the things that we recount in the book is the, is the kind of, more recent history of Africa's involvement in, in peacekeeping um, and the way in which a range of states have become much more prominent than they were previously or involved at all when they were never previously involved in the wider international context of the sort of um, the US uh, and allied intervention in Somalia in the 1990s and how that was perceived to have gone extremely badly for the United States and you know this feeling by US presidents sub subsequently that they shouldn't be sending US troops into um, these sorts of situations in the future. Um, and, you know, linked to that, uh, the Rwandan genocide and the feeling amongst lots of African um, countries that the international system had failed Rwanda. Um, and, you know, I think that, that that idea has been instrumentalized by, by different actors, both Rwanda and internationally, but it is also nonetheless, a, it's still a very, very powerful and real feeling. Um, and there's a kind of rawness to that sense of um, that the international system let down 
uh, Rwanda and should be relied upon to deal with those situations. You know, if the UN is for anything, then it should have been to, to prevent that happening. So I think we've got a kind of combination of, of both the kind of push and pull set of factors, which have created the international space for African states to engage more in, in peacekeeping, to take on more agency and initiative, um, but also to secure critically international financing for these sorts of operations in a way which previously wasn't necessarily there. I mean, there have been, you know, explicit comments made by um, by people like Barack Obama, for example, in 2015, 2016, where he basically said, you know, the great thing about um, African countries contributing to peacekeeping is that we can deal with these uh, situations that we find problematic and we want to sort out, but we don't have to put our own boots on the ground to deal with that. So I think there is a there is a kind of uh, if you like, a sort of satisficing model, which has been uh, developed over the last 15, 20 years, where Western actors want to continue to engage for nefarious reasons or otherwise in various different conflict theatres in Africa, but don't want to be putting their own troops, um, you know, actively involved in those. But on the other hand, you have a range of different African states who want to engage in peacekeeping for these normative reasons, but also for the whole range of uh, financial, political, geostrategic, and so forth, other reasons that I've, we talked about as well, which has led to this situation. Um, so I'm not really sure whether I would say it's, you know, thinking about the motivations, your question, whether it's the, the lack of scrutiny that's that's enabling these operations to, to take place. Um, I think it's it's more the 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 way in which the international system has has shifted in the ways in which peacekeeping is understood or rationalized, but also in, in some respects, the legitimacy or the authority of um, the kind of traditional overseers of peacekeeping, which would be, you know, the UN, um, Western powers, etc., and how that's shifted over the last 15, 20 years or so for those actors to no longer have the authority or the credibility in that space that maybe they once had, uh, if indeed they ever did. Um, so I think that there's there's partly that dimension as well, and the evolution of this phenomenon is such that there is no longer the structure in place that would recognise this as peacekeeping or not peacekeeping. We've got time for one last round of questions, and actually they've, they've started flooding in on the screen here as well. But let me start in the room, and then uh, and then we'll go to the screen. So, um, and if you can introduce yourself again, uh, I'm Salim Park, uh, you made a nice and um, good presentation. It's quite interesting. In your presentation, you did mention that Nigeria, as one of the contributing country, member country of airport, um, I mean, of peacekeeping, played a vital role in years back. But now, even the problem, the internal problem, the Nigerian people or I do not be a good part of this. Let me take you back. Most of the important role played by Nigeria in peacekeeping within African countries in, 19, in the 90s. The regime was under military regime. It was headed by a military mm -hmm. leader. Then I remember was uh, General Sana Abachi. Immediately after the return to democracy, after the election, when democratically elected government took place, things began to change. What do you think were the factors responsible for that setback? Don't you think maybe there was a political politicization of Nigerian military? Because from 23 years of military regime, anybody who emerged as the president of Nigeria, he ensure the top military official comes from the strife of the religion. The current president is an orderner, General uh, Muhammad Buhari, who happens to be a former military head of state. If you look at all the security there, the police, the head of police, the head of the like, army, the navy, SSS, and what I do, came from the same uh, part of the country. And it seems 
you are not being appointed based on merits. You are appointed based on the interest of, of uh, Mr. President. Don't you think these are some of the reasons why the current insecurity challenges that the country is facing is difficult to be dealt with, regardless of assisting other countries? Remember, in 1997, a top of government was an estate under the leadership of Nigeria, mostly Nigerian soldiers, uh, where Ahmad Tijani Kaba was reinstated after he was overthrown by uh, Paul Karoma in Sierra Leone. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mustafa. There was a question here. Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, my name is Hannah. I'm doing my first um, I had a question about uh, private military companies. I don't know if that's at all, but, um, but especially what the role of those is uh, in terms of the application. Great, thanks. So, so two questions from the floor. One from Mustafa about how much the change in domestic politics in Nigeria has changed Nigerian peacekeeping, um, particularly in terms of the politicization of the military. The question from Hannah about where do private military companies fit into all of this. Now, if I can just throw to you a couple of questions mm -hmm. from the from the screen here. So uh, we, we've got a couple of questions actually from Oscar. Um, he, he wants to know the extent to which troop contributing countries in Africa have been effective or otherwise in tackling insurgencies, given that most of them have been prepared for more conventional warfare. Um, and he's also interested in what's the impact of host country social institutions in the success or failure of, of peacekeeping operations. Um, and then finally, a question from Maita Pat, uh, who's doing an MA in Japanese studies at SOAS. And Maita Pat's uh, wanting to know to what extent you, you uh, tackle uh, Japanese positions on peacekeeping in Somalia? Where does Japan as a kind of funder and organizer of peacekeeping um, fit into, into your picture? Thanks, Jonathan. Okay, so unfortunately, I'm going to have to spend a lot of time saying we don't really look into that, um, <laughs> which is not really where I'd hope to end up. Um, but yeah, we don't tend, to, we haven't really looked very much at uh, private military companies in the book. Um, I don't know whether Nina would be able to speak to that from her experience in, in the Sahel. Um, I mean, I guess it's going to be an increasingly significant issue with the growing role of Russia um, in the continent as well, and we're already seeing that. Um, but uh, I'm afraid I haven't um, got much to say on that front, unfortunately. Um, and the same goes really for um, the point on Japan um, as well. So uh, apologies <laughs> on that score as well. I think that the, the question about the domestic politics and, and peacekeeping is a is an important one. I think you you probably would be able to um, answer that question more articulately than me. Um, although I do have a kind of fairly good understanding of the you know changing dynamics of Nigerian politics over the last twenty years or so. Um, I mean, I think Nigeria is a really complex case because on the one hand there was this transition from um, you know military to civilian. Um, but on the other hand, a lot of the key actors were still the same, or the military was was still prominent, but more in terms of you know the the role of individual senior figures. Um, you know, I think this is this this election next year was going to be the first one um, since the, you know the return of democracy when one of the leading candidates has not been a former military dictator. Um, so I guess that 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 shift presumably changed the ways in which some of those senior actors thought about their their role within the wider Nigerian polity and focused themselves more on their domestic um, support base and political um, uh, coalitions rather than being able to assume that they could um, do stuff on a regional level. But I think that the, the main thing that's happened over the last 10 years or so is just the fact that um, security in Nigeria is 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 non-existent in in the kind of north east and northwest effectively parts of of the country and I, I talked a little bit about that in relation to Boko Haram and the Lake Chad basin and it's just the the the, the ability and the credibility of a state to be able to play a prominent role in peacekeeping when 
it's unable to effectively deal with security issues in large swathes of its territory um, uh, is, is, you know, really, really challenging. And I think that's a position that Nigeria is in now. I mean, it has tried to engage in regional peacekeeping aspects through these, these smaller coalitions. Um, but because ECOWAS has been so associated with Nigerian hegemony and, and regional leadership, it's very difficult to use that institution to also try and deal with um, insecurity that it itself is unable to control within its own territory. Um, I, I think with the question about insurgencies, I'm not sure whether, um, I think it really depends on, on the state and, and the country in question. I mean, there are some African states that are prominent in peacekeeping, which uh, have got a, I don't necessarily want to say good record, um, but an effective record when it comes to dealing with insurgencies. Uganda would be um, a good example of that. Um, but then, you know, there are others with more traditional um, armies, which where, you know, that is not part of the, the fabric of, of their experience. And we do talk a little bit about in the book, the different types of African militaries that we see in the continent. So I've been talking about militaries in general terms throughout the last hour or so, but actually there are lots of different kind of models of military in Africa. There are some of the more kind of historic colonial force model, which you see to a certain extent in places like Nigeria or Ghana or, or Malawi or Kenya. But then you also have states like Uganda or Rwanda or Ethiopia, um, where there's been a very radical transformation of the, the nature of the military, um, its relationship with um, the region and politics, um, who engage and have experiences which are very different. So I think it really depends on um, drilling down into the, the context and experience of particular militaries. I'm going to abuse my role as chair and ask a final question. Um, you mentioned the role of peacekeeping missions in post-conflict reconstruction at one stage. And, you know, one of the things that strikes me that when I go back to that list of contributing countries that you had before there, John, was, you, you know, not only is there a, a large range of authoritarian and militarized African states, but what strikes me as interesting is how many of these are also post-conflict mm. African states, yeah. some of which have themselves had peacekeepers on their soil, who then end up sending their own post-conflict militaries off to become peacekeepers in other places. And it strikes me, and I'm sure this is something you do within the books, and I'm trying to tease out something I, I know you've thought about, um, which is the, the role of these peacekeeping missions in post-conflict post pardon me, post-conflict reconstruction in the contributing countries themselves. Um, and I'm thinking here particularly of the Great Lakes countries. So, you know, Rwanda, Uganda, and Burundi, within their peacekeeping ranks, all have integrated rebels. Yeah. And how much of these missions, amongst all of the other objectives that you've rightly ascribed to them, it's how much is it also about a sense of unity, reconciliation, integration of rebellions at home? You know, where does that kind of domestic post-conflict reconstruction agenda fit into these, these missions? I'd, I'd be interested to, to hear you talk a bit about that. Yeah, I think that's a really, really important point. And it is, it's something I didn't talk very much about in the presentation. But as you say, it does it is something we, we focus on quite a lot in the book. And we've got a chapter on that. Um, I think Burundi is, and maybe Rwanda as well, even DRC to some extent, are, are all good examples of kind of post-conflict, if you want to call Congo post-conflict states, which have actually sought to use peacekeeping as a way to, um, you know, build, um, yeah, not necessarily partnership, but cohesion within the within the military, partly because, yeah, I mean, I guess in the case of somewhere like Burundi, you have the former former military of the, of the state and then various rebel movements. And it's one thing to have them, um, you know, acting domestically um, in a particular way. But if you then deploy them abroad, particularly on a, a kind of notionally normative mission, then that creates a sense of shared purpose and collective um, experience and engagement. So I, I think that's that's really, really critical. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why we also see this um, uh, circulation of, of um, the entire military in the case of Burundi as, as part of that. I mean, the peacekeeping training centers are also an important kind of space for, for, for doing that as well. Um, I think one of the one of the questions that I continue to have about some of this though is how because a lot of the discourse that you see from from governments in this area is about pan-Africanism um, and particularly in, in the case of post-conflict states, we went through a conflict and we know what it's like to rebuild a state. So we want to basically go elsewhere and do this somewhere else. So that's, you know, that was what Uganda said when it 
century to Liberia in the 1990s. It's what um, lots of different contributors to the uh, Amazon operation have been saying as well. But I think there's, there's firstly the question about actually how how true that is and how or how appropriate that is. You know, to what extent do the just because you are an East African country, to what extent does that mean that your experience has got lessons for country you know, the other side of the continent? Um, and even in, in you know, the example I gave of Somalia, you know, Uganda and Somalia are in the same region, if you like, but the, the lessons that the Ugandan leadership is taking about its own experience and seeking to apply to Somalia um, is, is not you know, cognizant of local uh, and national understandings of authority in someone like Somalia. So I think that there, there is a lot to unpack when it comes to the, the transfer of lessons that different African peacekeeping states and contributors are making in these sorts of missions um, and going beyond the kind of normative ideational idea that we have a responsibility to, to do this. But as you were saying, kind of looking in a little bit more depth about well, what is actually the lessons that they're trying to apply on the ground and is that actually appropriate or meaningful in the context of another country? I mean, a lot, a lot of the, the more critical debates on peacekeeping and peace building more broadly are about the, the problems of Western actors in particular, like applying lessons from their own understanding of what works to contexts where that's completely inappropriate and where the you know, frames of reference are entirely different. But I'm not sure how much we've, we've thought about whether that's also the case by some African states in peacekeeping missions in Africa, both positively and negatively. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's really significant and important and interesting. And I'll, I'll give the last word to Nina because I can I can see Nina's hand up here. So thanks, Nina. Ah, oh, thank you. Yeah, I actually yeah I just wanted to check that Jonathan doesn't blame all the faults on me, and that's why I'm also <laughs> listening in. <laughs> But it was also because the, the last question is really, um, really close to, to my main research interest and, and obviously Jonathan's also, but I've written quite a lot on, on how post-conflict states use peacekeeping as a way to increase their status um, in international relations, especially as you pointed out, Phil, uh, Rwanda and Burundi, who have become these new peacekeepers over the past 10 years. Not only because it has um, Marco Joel, who we already cited, has already written on Rwanda using peacekeeping um, and military operations as a way to form a more cohesive national army. But the same could be said uh, about Burundi, which managed to slow down the demobilization of former um, combatants um, from, from uh, the new Burundian army um, by sending troops to different peace operations or actually it was army some. Um, so I think that there is a really an, an important um, aspect of looking inside the states, uh, which we're doing in this book, and especially then for the post-conflict states and looking at how um, I was comparing um, Burundi and Rwanda's speeches at the UN General Assembly over the years since they first started contributing troops to peace operations. And there is a trend that they're uh, consistently referring to their status as peacekeepers once they started to contribute states. So basically in the book, we're arguing that they're going from the peace kept status, which is more of a, let's say victim or passive status to towards a more active status as a peacekeeper, which of course is also gaining more leverage in international relations more broadly. So I'll, I'll end it on that. But yes, we, we do deal with it quite extensively in the book. Fantastic. Um, I think the only thing that is left for me as chair to do is once again to remind you all to get a flyer, buy a copy of the book, because I think it's a really important book at a really important time. And also to say thank you both to Nina and to Jonathan for a really stimulating discussion here for bringing this content here to SOAS. Delighted as well to hear you name check both Marco Jal and Emma Birakora. So two people who recently got their PhDs out of SOAS yeah. and have been writing on various things. Good to see some of their ideas yeah, flowing yeah. back into some of the halls where they were sort of created in the first place. So there's a nice circularity come to all of that. But yeah, Nina and Jonathan, thanks so much for, uh, for a fantastic, uh, fantastic event. Thanks for it. Thank you.